Hello and welcome to another episode of The Winding Stairs. I am your host, Juan Sepulveda, and I thank you very much for taking the time to join us on this journey up the winding stairs. Today we have a special treat for you because we have a very talented brother who has discovered a new face in his life by incorporating his Masonic education into his creation of art. Brother Ryan Flynn is, is a brother who has been an artist for all his life, but he joined Masonry in 2010 and shortly thereafter began creating work that inspires brothers from all over the country and all over the world. Uh, all over the world. Thank you very much, Brother Ryan, for joining us tonight. How are you? I am fantastic. Thank you for having me. I, uh, I'm a big fan of this and uh, honored that you would uh, ask me to join you. Thank you. It is, it is, it is my pleasure. Uh, I have liked your work from the very moment that I saw it, and I found it inspiring, and I identified with it, which is the reason why I wanted to bring you on, on the winding stairs and to share your work and some of your knowledge with the brothers that listen and watch The Winding Stairs. Yeah, uh, same thing with you. I, uh, I love your work, and um, I've been pretty excited since you asked me to do this because uh, it's a rarity when you get a couple artists together to talk, and uh, as, as we both know, this is our passion in life, so I'm, I'm expecting good things. <laughs> Most definitely. And to the brothers that are watching um, live, you have an option to add your questions. We have a question and action, a question and answer session that is going on live. If you're watching this through YouTube or through Google Plus, you can ask questions. And at the end of the of our conversation, we're going to try to squeeze some time in to answer some of your questions. We've already received many questions through Facebook and through the Google Plus page. So that's another way in which you can ask questions because our conversation will continue beyond tonight's broadcast. Brother, first I want to to give you an opportunity to let us know a little bit more about your your history as as an artist. Uh, what is your background as an artist? Um, I was always the art geek in uh, school. Um, pretty much shared the office with my art teacher back in high school. Um, uh, oddly enough, I took a year off from that in college and realized that uh, I, I had made a bad choice and went back in as a fine arts and graphic design major um, at UMass uh, Lowell. And um, in 2006, I, uh, I studied abroad in Florence and, and learned about art history and painting over there. And um, yeah, it, I, I had actually slowed down in my pr uh, producing art. I, I part painted past, in my pastime. Um, not really producing a lot, and um, when masonry came around, you know, it's just this endless supply of motivation to, to start creating again, so I started really stepping it up and um, kind of seeing what was out there, what used to be out there, and what needs to be out there, and um, here I am. <laughs> that's, that's excellent. Uh, going, going back to the point of uh, studying in, in Italy, you said in 2006 you went to... Yep, I, uh, I had an apartment for the summer um, right in the heart of Florence. Um, nice. Went to as many art museums as possible, painted on the uh, banks of the Arno, and um, really, really incorporated myself with this whole lifestyle of, of being an artist um, and having a studio. Um, it really taught me a lot because, you know, those of, those of you listening who have traveled to Italy in particular, in Europe, and I guess you could say, um, Art is appreciated a lot more over there. It's it's part of the history, uh, and the locals uh, are just as proud of their art history as they are their national history. Um, so it, it's just this refresher. I call I call Florence my muse because if I go back there, and the couple times I've gone back, um, it's just it just you know reverberates this creative passion in me, and I, I come back and get the easel out. That's that's excellent. I love I absolutely love Italy, in particular Florence. I think it's it's so rich with so much inspiration. You can see when when I was there, I could think these are the same streets that some of the artists that I admire walked. Yeah. 
you can see their houses, you can see the places where they actually did business, and, and it's certainly very inspiring to see other, uh, almost like the behind the scenes yeah. of, of, of the artists. I, I, one point that really I remember vividly was um, my, my teacher, Peter, uh, brought us into uh, a museum that was being uh, rebuilt and uh, brought us into a room into it, and he took us over here, and he says, this is the original floor. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's great. That's an old floor. He goes, this is the room that Michelangelo carved David in. Wow. And I was just, okay, I need to take a moment now. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm standing on the same floor that Michelangelo did, and he, uh, he, he also told me to touch a Michelangelo, which that, that's when I started thinking he was a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Had to well, say, you don't understand a sculpture until you touch it. And I said, I beg to differ, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to touch it. Yeah. I don't want to break it. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's excellent. And and I'm curious to know, you know, a few years after coming back from, from Florence, you you then joined Masonry. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that you began to see the art that was available uh, for Masonry. Uh, what in particular got you the most excited about Masonic art? Um, I kind of fell into Masonic art a little, a little weird. Um, I, I got thrown a project right away, and um, I didn't really do a lot of res research before um, I did that. Uh, there was there was these fake, um, th excuse me, there were these windows that were in my lodge that were all boarded up, and and um, one of the People who run our Masonic building was going to put these fake Masonic, uh, fake window, stained glass windows up. There was no symbolism to them. They were, it was a very boring design, and um, my name got thrown out in front of them. And I said, "Listen, I need to do this, and you need to stop." <laughs> so um, they they trusted me. I hadn't shown them any work, and um, gave myself a week to do it. And I started researching all this Masonic art while I was doing this, and I, I realized like how deep some of this stuff goes. Um, you know, the layman looks at a tracing board from the 1700s and goes, "That's a pretty picture," but there's just so much in these things. Um, so that really got me going, and um, I did those windows right when I was starting to go through the chairs, um, and I, I actually had to skip a couple, and um, it really started hitting me when I was um, senior senior deacon and learning the middle chamber lecture because <laughs> I, I started learning it, then I said, all right, I have to draw this. And then I stopped learning it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a few months later, I finally learned the thing, but um, I produced my first series. And um, then I just started researching it. I love looking at it. There's a couple of fa fantastic books out there that, um, that are just Masonic art books, and I recommend... Uh, um, people looking at them. I'll put them in the uh, the notes on the page when we're done and have some perfect. links for you guys. Yeah, that, that works that works perfectly fine. We I, I like it when we come across resources that other brothers have have read and they can recommend because clearly there's a lot of things out there that are not great when it comes to masonry. But if we can find those good books that really give us some good knowledge, that's that's fantastic. Mm. And uh, the the other thing I wanted to ask you was that this research that you began doing, familiarizing yourself more with the history of the of the arts in masonry, led to one more step in what you in what you do. You actually mm -hmm. travel through different lodges and give presentations regarding art in masonry, right? Yeah, um, my big uh, um, project in my life right now is trying to get the arts back into masonry. Um, as you and I were discussing before uh, we got on this, um, one of the great things about being an artist as opposed to different uh, professions, um, there's not a lot of competition. It, it, if you love art, you love all forms of art, and you want art to succeed. So um, one of the presentations I do um, pretty much does an overview of how there used to be a lot of artists in masonry, and they produced phenomenal things, you, you Mount Rushmore, you know, you know, Statue of Liberty, those are the, you know, the showcase ones. But uh, in, in every town in America, you always had some sort of monument or, um, you know, celebration over some building that involved the Masons. They were involved in funding public art, and a lot of it. 
Um, I'm currently working on a research paper that will link the um, when a lodge did promote, uh, you know, for example, a statue in town, what their membership ha what happened to their membership right after it? Did they get more people to come in because of that? Because it's a fantastic, I know people will shudder at the word, advertisement for masonry. Um, you know, having having a, a, a group that totally supports projects like that is will do so much more good for the craft than a billboard. <laughs> Which, yeah. Um, yeah, visibility. I think it's 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 another word that would describe it mm -hmm. better. It's not just the the promotion of Freemasonry. It's not that we're saying, oh, join Freemasonry, but we're allowing the people that are uh, predisposed to to be interested to see it. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's it's before them. So it's not like putting a billboard, like you said, or or doing a commercial. Yeah, and the the other thing I like to talk about is you know the the beginning of that is just talking about art and lodge. Um, right now, and I'm sure you, you, you probably agree with me, the only way we're getting artists into, cra into the craft right now is by happenstance. You've got a guy who joins a lodge and, uh, oh yeah, I'm an artist, I, I might try something like that. But if, if your lodge were to outwardly visit art museums, have lectures, talk about the arts, you're going to attract these people that used to be in the, in the lodge all the time. And um, bringing that back in really enhances the experience for all the other Masons that are in your lodge. And um, I've found that out firsthand. I'm sure you have too. Um, and it's, uh, it's a very powerful thing. And it, as, a, as a Masonic artist, uh, I, I find that both of us and all the other Masonic artists out there are really charged to do that. It's part of our obligation. Use the talents that God has given you to better the craft. So... Uh, it's a struggle at some times, uh, but uh, it's a it's a great, great journey. If if you, in, I've I've talked about this before. If if you have a particular talent that you can put to the service of of the craft and helping your brothers learn the lessons, even better. Even if you're if you're a musician, if you're a poet, and we we're very fortunate that we live in the era that we live where. We we can share the things that we do so easily, and mm -hmm. we can reach really far and wide with when you when we create something, and so we're fortunate to to be able to see that and and get inspired. Hopefully, some mm -hmm. of the the viewers and listeners of this program can derive some inspiration from what we are discussing. You have a talent. If you can figure out how to motivate other brothers or further your own pursuit of perfection. Then, by all means, you know, go go full absolutely. full throttle on it. Yep, absolutely. So, moving to the to the next section, one of the things that we want to discuss is five art mediums that you can find in masonry, and these are five mediums that can be very effective in the delivery of the lessons and the allegorical teachings that we can find in in our system, and we, were, we will be discussing five of them today, and but let's start, start with the first one that we are very familiar with, which is painting. Um, it, can you give us a little bit of an idea of what you found in your research about the role that painting has had in masonry? Well, um, you know, the, the, the very obvious uh, example is tracing boards. Um, when you go back to the 18th century and early 19th century, you had tracing boards that um, were made before the printing process and the large format printing process was perfected, um, and uh, those were paintings. And uh, in my research with them, because I just produced one of my own, it, it's quite remarkable how the Industrial Revolution kind of changed that. Um, actually, Patrick Craddock has a, a fantastic presentation on his aprons that we'll, we'll talk about later. Um, when he gets into what the Industrial Revolution did for uh, Masonic aprons. But, you know, before that whole mass reproduction thing happened, these, these tracing boards were lodge-specific, and these lodges had them made for their, their own stuff, I mean, for their, for their own lodge. And they were very personal. It was, that was, you know, you know, our lodge tracing board. That's not your lodge tracing board. This is ours. We're very proud of it. We, it was a big deal when we took it out for our candidates. And it added this, like, really nice personalization to it. 
It, for the for those who might not know what a tracing board is, a tracing board is a you can compare it to a chart that contains a lot of the symbols that we use in the various teachings uh, of the degrees. So they're used to facilitate the visual learning and the visual association with the knowledge that is presented to the to the new candidate or the new uh, advanced mm -hmm. brother. And it also helps the, the person that's giving the teaching to keep track of all the, the lessons that have to be discussed during the, during the ceremonies. That's, that's the gist of what a tracing board is. And, you know, we, well, let's face it, some of the histories are quite long, too. And, you know, you got a guy who just went through a degree and you're getting this lecture and uh, it can be a little bit daunting. Um, we just used my tracing board for the first time in our watch and it, it was remarkable to see how much better the presenter's ritual was and the guys were glued to it. You know, it, it really adds a lot to it. Um, and I really like that old style look when this is our tracing board because when you get into the you know the mid 1800s, the late 1800s, you know lithographs came out and every lodge had the same one all of a sudden, and you you lose that personalization to it. You, you and um, you know that's that's stuff that drives artists nuts. <laughs> you know why does everybody need the same thing? Yeah, uh, <laughs> um, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> so. Uh, but it, it's a wonderful tool, and um, it, it's it's they're fun to paint. It, it really is because it, there's so much involved in them, and um, even when you make mistakes, it, it, you, it's a learning experience for the artist too. Exactly, and that I think that's the key. That's the key word there, learning, because in in some of the projects that I've conducted for for lodges, and I, I want to make sure that what I put out is is something. Of great quality mm -hmm. that I spend the time making sure that I present things correctly that I'm not making up stuff because this is something that's going to outlive me mm -hmm. so I, I wanted to be a good representation of, of, of who I was of course and but one thing that that you do when you're painting is you're constantly learning absolutely not just technique but you're learning about the history of these symbols you're learning about mm -hmm. It's uh, their application and and how to accurately portray them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's that's a benefit that the brothers have, regardless of what medium you are creative in. That's part of your of your process of, of growth. You're learning as you're creating something to help other people learn. Yeah, and um, one of one of the things you just spoke about uh, leads me to another way paintings work uh, with masonry, um, it outlives you. You know, I, I think every goal of an artist or every, you know, dream of an artist is to know that one of your works will be there, you know, a hundred years after you're gone. That's, you know, when I, when I do my stuff, that's kind of what I like to think about is, you know, maybe my great-grandson will come find this in a lodge someday or something, God willing. Um, but there's an old school thought to art that has kind of lost its way, and I have a recent example. Um, I was talking to a lodge. Um, I, I do some certificates. We'll talk about those later. Um, and they wanted to give a certificate to a very elderly person. Um, and, you know, I started talking to them. I said, you, you, maybe you should think about this in, from an art, artistic sort of way. You know, let's be realistic. When, when he passes, where's that going to go? The family's going to do it. Maybe it'll go up in the attic and stuff like that. But if you commission something like a portrait of this guy, the, this, this gentleman was uh, an officer in the lodge for 50 some odd years. I said, well, what if you did a portrait and put it in, in the lodge as an honorarium to him? Now you have nice. that work of art you know, being part of the lodge and not just for him. And, and that's the old school kind of way of thinking about art that People are kind of pushing aside now, and uh, paintings are the perfect example of it because you, you can paint anything. Yeah, and it, it also adds to the traveling experience. Mm -hmm. One thing you hear me talk a lot a, a lot about is the importance of traveling. And as much as I can, I have my limitations, but as much as I can, I try to visit different lodges. And when there's art in the walls, mm -hmm. when there are portraits of the people that pass through that lodge. The, those are conversation starters. Those give you an opportunity to learn more about the history of that lodge, to learn more about masonry, and, and to just feast your eyes. 
Mm -hmm. Some of the some of these uh, paintings are uh, immovable. Like the the Grand Lodge of Puerto Rico has uh, some amazing murals. If you want to see them, you either see a picture online, or you actually have to go to the lodge and see them in place, which is what I would recommend. I mean, I haven't seen yeah. them personally. My whole family has, yeah. which I, I envy, but that's one of the things that I have on my checklist. When I go, I'll have the fortune of seeing in for in, in person these paintings that I have been seeing uh, through the Internet for, for many years now. Yeah, and it's it's historically that's the way it works for centuries. It's how do you build pride in, in a, an organization? You commission art, uh, you know, the, the Catholic Church, of course, they had always had the money to do it. But if you, you know, a perfect example is, is Italy. You go to all these towns and you see all these government buildings, and they're just adorned with art. And you know, in Florence, a good example, they have art that they have celebrations for every year, because they're so proud of that artwork. And that should be going into every lodge as well. Um, the, uh, like you said, the. You, the um, the Puerto Rico lodge that, that I'm sure they are extremely proud of that mural as they oh should. absolutely uh, it's an accomplishment for um, both the lodge and the artist um, absolutely and um, that needs to be um, that needs to be brought back it, it desperately does because it is just a great way to make that traveling experience even more oh yeah M most definitely um, the the other Let's move on to the to the next mm -hmm. uh, way in which art has played a role, and you mentioned it uh, earlier. the The aprons, the apron has had a role in in masonry that has been similar to a canvas. It's almost a, a place where you can express yourself. And mm -hmm. you were going to mention uh, brother uh, Patrick. Uh, the he's the he's the artist behind um, Craftsman's aprons, and he does a fantastic work illustrating some of the symbols of, of masonry. So uh, tell us a little bit more about what you know about the the aprons' uh, role in art and masonry. Well, um, we were lucky enough to have Patrick come up to our lodge a couple of years ago and do a presentation on this very thing, and it kind of ties in with um, with what I said about. The, the tracing boards, you know, they were very personalized. They were given as, you know, wives would sew them for their husband's best friends in lodge, and that that was, you know, one of these great gifts that they would give. Um, you know, the Civil War people wore all these 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 uh, great aprons, and then the Industrial Revolution came, and you know, this is the Master Mason's apron now. It has a square on it. You know, and and it kind of just got mundane, and that whole idea of personalization kind of went went haywire. Um, now, obviously, I don't know all the facts of it, and I do recommend if, if any lodge is looking for a speaker, uh, Patrick is, it's a fantastic uh, presentation. Um, but, you know, it, it's an it's a opportunity for a brother to really express what he loves about masonry. There's every brother out there has that symbol they love. They, they have that part of ritual that really hits them hard. Put it on your apron and be proud of it. And when people ask, talk about it. Um, and I know you. Um, I envy your work with the uh, with your aprons because it's so <laughs> controlled, and I look like an idiot when I paint. This. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna hold the brush upside down, but it's gonna get what I want. But um, your, your your fine line work, I, I absolutely love. I appreciate that. And there's no uh, way I'll ever be able to do it. <laughs> no, of course you will. You, you're, you're a great artist. <laughs> you know, uh, I wanted to mention before I forget that we, um, as, as you, you all know, I'm a member of the Masonic Roundtable, and, and we, we also bring brothers. We interview them. We have discussions about different topics in masonry, and we had the pleasure of having Brother Craddock uh, come over to the Masonic Roundtable. So... Um, I encourage you, if you haven't listened to any of his lectures, uh, one good thing to do is to go to uh, watch that episode of the Masonic Roundtable where we talked about aprons. And him, you know, him and I, we geeked out about aprons <laughs> for a whole hour. <laughs> yeah. So uh, he, he talks a lot about that, about the fact that at one point it was that... Um, it was a very, very personal thing that you would wear to lodge. And when you come across 
the the aprons of of great men that we admire, like George Washington, and they're very intricate, very elaborate, full of symbolism that is not just Masonic. Some of the symbols contained in these aprons are are personal. There are things of their careers, of their lives, and if you think about it, you know. The apron is the badge of a mason. That's your badge, and you wear it, and you are in contact with it whenever you're in a meeting. You are with it constantly, mm -hmm. and you, in, in the in the process of the meeting, you might catch a glimpse at a symbol that reminds you of 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 the lessons, and you're in the perfect environment to be reminiscing about these lessons. Um, I, I think it's it's something special that I think should be more popular. In, in my opinion, in, in in masonry, because that was one shock that I had. Whenever I joined masonry, I thought that when I walked in to the, to the lodge room for the first time, I was going to see all these aprons hand painted, hand sewn, and I was I was up for a shock when all of them were white, and the only ones with decorations were uh, were the officer ones. Mm -hmm. I thought everybody was going to have a personalized apron on. Yeah. Which is what got me started uh, making them. So yeah, I, I, the other aspect I like about it is, and, it, and it's the art artist's uh, mindset. When you when I see a work of art, I like to go into why is it there, and I think about it as as a piece and as a presentation. And you know, when people see you know George Washington's apron, every Mason's probably seen the picture of it. Yeah, it's it's full of these symbols, but when I look at it, I'm like, why did he put this on here, or why was this put on here? It's it's very specific in how it's done, and the the way it's organized and stuff. It's it's not just like the tracing boards of it. It's an it's an original piece, and um, it it puts you in that mindset. What and you start thinking, what did Washington stand for? Well, what part of masonry does that overlap in? And and it's a great way to just kind of understand the past a little bit. And it would be like exactly like you said. It's the badge of a mason. So if you see someone coming in with a big Euclid's forty-seven period, all right, they're a lover of the arts. Say, okay, let's talk. <laughs> um, you know, and uh, or a past master. Yeah, or a past master. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and I, I really, I really like that. I really like seeing them. I like making them, and pretty much all of the ones that I've made that are very, very intricate, I've sold. So whenever I go to lodge with one of my own aprons, is a plain one. <laughs> yeah, I, I, still, I keep but, saying I'm gonna make one for myself, and I it's like a tattoo. I'm like, yeah, I'm doing this. Well, no, no, I can't do it. <laughs> yeah, one, one of these days. Yeah, I can't settle on a design. All right, so let's move on to the the third uh, art medium that plays a role in masonry, and is Masonic documents. A Masonic document is something that a brother is going to keep for the rest of his life. Perhaps it's going to pass as an heirloom to one of his family members when he goes to the Celestial Lodge above. And it's not just a document. This is, it is, it's a statement. It's, mm -hmm. it's evidence of something great that happened in a brother's life. And I wanted to ask you, you very early on in your in your Masonic artistic uh, track, began working on a series of of Masonic documents. Can you tell us a little bit more about them? Yeah, I um, when I studied art history, I was always fascinated with medieval art and early Renaissance art. I just loved the way it was done. Um, I loved the symbol of what symbolism. I loved the technique, and I really liked illuminated documents. Um, it was just something that I. If you see them in person, they're they're incredible. Um, I was look. I'm lucky enough to have seen the Book of Kells in Ireland, and you're just looking at this and thinking about how much passion went into this and how much time. And you know, when I when I joined Masonry, I, I went through my degrees, and my lodge gave me this very nice certificate, um, with, you know, with seal and all the signatures on it. And you know, I'm, I was looking at it, and I said, you know, this is really great, but it's kind of just a photocopy. Um, you know, you just got through this degree that said this is going to be the greatest honor of your life to join this fraternity, and you should treat it as such. And you know, here's here we got this at Kinkos for you. Um, and and that kind of and don't get me wrong, I I am forever grateful for that. It's framed in my bedroom. I I wake up and I see it every day. Um, 
But I decided, you know, maybe there's there's a way to, you know, if someone wanted to give a gift to someone or, or a lodge wanted to really do something special, bringing that um, illuminated document into it. And for those who don't know what an illuminated document is, um, it's called illuminated because it's you, uh, a true one is done on vellum, uh, which is just calfskin, very, very thin and, and treated. And you either hammer or glue gold and other precious metals into it. Uh, and when the sun hits it, it glows, it illuminates. So um, I took it as an idea to to make some. I knew they were going to be very expensive to do, uh, so I, I came up with like a second tier one, which was just a, a G-clay print that I would hand accent with the gold and stuff afterward. And then eventually I said, all right, well, I might as well do the real deal too, um, which was, was scary because I have the worst handwriting in, <laughs> in America. Uh, doctors don't know what I write. Uh, but uh, there it is, learning, you know. But um, it, it real, I, I do them for free for every Master Mason in my lodge now. Um, it's my way of giving back to my lodge, and you can tell it's special. It, it's, it's not just a piece of paper. Um, they don't get the real ones, by the way. Um, let's we'll put. That. <laughs> oh, I, yeah. I was gonna say. <laughs> yeah, I, no. <laughs> We're gonna be raising the dues for that one. <laughs> I was gonna say I just I just made the decision to be yeah, a full yeah, member. <laughs> That's ancient New York Lodge, <laughs> Um No, but um, you know it's it's just my way of giving back, and it it makes it so much more personal. And um, I know there are a lot of graphic designers out there who are masons. Um, that is a very easy way to get back in your lodge and give stuff back to them. Yeah, I'd love you to. You know, by mine, that's that's great and all, but you know, as as Juan and I discuss a lot, it, it's the best thing that both of us can do is motivate other artists to to start bringing it to the craft because it'll strengthen the craft. Or and you know, if you want to buy it from us, that's fine. I, I don't mind. Yeah, we <laughs> yeah we we appreciate. That. <laughs> Let's get that yeah. straight. Um, yeah. But um, you know, it's 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 just that idea of making the documents more than just a piece of paper that that really hits home. And and that's you know you touch on something too. There are brothers that are graphic designers and and work with computers and work with you know programming and developing. Your talent is also uh, useful for your lodge. Every lodge in, in this at this day and age should have a functioning website. Should have a presence Absolutely. somewhere in social media, and. Perhaps you're not. You don't have to make a painting or a sculpture, but you could create graphics for your lodge. Mm -hmm. and you're still using your talent for the betterment of the craft and and to help your your brothers. So, I encourage bro brothers to to consider that. Those of you who have talent, mm -hmm. uh, I would like to also remind the people watching live that we have uh, a question and answer section. I've already seen some questions. Uh, from Brother Sean Haney, uh, Nicholas Lane, and, and among others. But one of the questions that I wanted to touch on very quickly, they wanted to see uh, illustrations of the tracing boards that you've created. We are going to share links in the descriptions of the videos. And, and we've had some brothers also take the initiative to post <laughs> some of the links uh, already, so we appreciate for those that have done that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So let's continue, and the next art medium that, that we, we talked about was sculpture. And we've talked about two-dimensional work from the very beginning. Now we're giving it an additional dimension. A 3D art is something that is very impressive. Mm. It's something that can convey a lot with, uh, with, a, with a little. You can you can say a lot with with a little, mm -hmm. and there are even in our modern practice of, of masonry some symbols that are sculptures. But first, uh, I wanted to speak with you regarding uh, what role do you think sculpture plays or has played in masonry? Well, I mean, it's the basis of masonry. I mean, if you study architecture like we're all supposed to, and you go to a cathedral, it's it's a work of art. Um, our operative brothers were masons, uh, were masons, and they were also artists. 
Um, if you've ever taken a chisel to a piece of stone, um, you know how much work it is. I, it's, it's, I can't imagine. Um, it, when you when you go to like some of these big cathedrals like the Duomo in Milan that has like a ridiculous amount of spires and and you're just thinking about all these masons who just spent countless hours carving for this one huge piece. Um, so you know sculpture and masonry one they're one and the same. Um, I've seen sculpture recently being added to. Um, to lodges from brothers who kind of dabbled in it, and it, it's great. Um, I saw someone doing a circumpunct. He, he knew how to bend metal, so he decided to make one for his lodge. And, you know, all of a sudden, the lodge has this personalized work of art that's hanging on their wall, and it's really interesting to look at. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of people out there who know how to cut wood, know how to... Um, uh, shape wood, carve wood, even, you know, burn wood. You know, a lot of these, uh, it used to be a great pastime of, you know, like burning wood designs. Um, you know, those guys, you know, do a series of all the emblems of a master mason. Do blocks of them and then present them in lodge. Now you have a work of art in your lodge that's, you know, site-specific, it's yours, and it will be passed on before you. And, you know, that's just one example. I'm sure you have mm -hmm. a lot more. Oh, that's, that's, that's true. And one thing that I... When you mention architecture, we have clearly not all lodges are going to be very ornate and very, uh, very elaborate, but some have had the privilege of of having some real three dimensional work, some good sculpting, some friezes in the in the in the architecture, and it's very impressive to actually see it and and see how it varies when the light hits it from from different areas as the sun sets yeah. or it rises, you, you have a different work of art altogether. And it is inspiring to see different mediums of art. And it's the whole reason why we're doing this. We want to talk about the role of art in general in, in masonry. And, you know, simply put, is, is to inspire you and to remind you of these lessons. And the, the pillar of beauty as we've alluded to in the title of the of, of of our event, it's it's important. It's a very important component, and yet sometimes it's not given the importance that it means. Yeah, yeah, and it's one of those things that I think, you know, we're taught the several the seven liberal arts and sciences. Well, the only thing that I can think of that unites all seven is art. Yeah. Um there's art in everything. There's art in music, obviously. There's art in geometry. There's art in rhetoric. There's poems. There's po you know, poetry, uh, stories. You know, every aspect of the liberal arts can be per uh, portrayed in arts. And um, the role of a, a Masonic artist is, is to do that in a way that both respects the craft and brings honor to it. Um, so, you know, it's just... It, it, there's so much you can do with art. It, it, there's no way one person can be, yeah, I got it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I got this. Yeah, yeah, you, got, you all can go home. <laughs> I'm going to do a painting. <laughs> that's, that's very true. Yeah. Uh, now, the, let's, let's move on to, to the final one, and it, it is jewelry. And I wanted to, to talk about jewelry not just in the rings because it's, it's one of the most popular uh, jewels that we can think of, but jewelry, uh, like for the jewels of the lodge, we we have famous brothers like Paul Revere, who who was a metal worker and he created works of art as as the jewels of the lodge that are still available today. And you have a, a an interesting story about this. Uh, yeah, um, well, to hear. I I, for, I um, grew up in Concord, Massachusetts, you know, with Battle of Lexington and Concord, and um, I didn't know at the time that Paul Revere started the uh, lodge there, a Corinthian Lodge, I think it is. Um, so I'm simplifying the story. I'm sure you can get a better version of it somewhere else. But um, in 2006, the year I was, I was initiated, um, they were cleaning their attic and stumbled upon jewels that are thought to be made by him. Uh, in Paul Revere silver, so they invited everybody to um, to come and see them. And this was my first. I think I was in EA for like six days, 
and oh I got gosh. to come in here, and I'm looking at all this Paul Revere, you know, potential Paul Revere silver laid out. Uh, the funny story was that there was two versions of how they found it. The first guy who was talking about it said, yeah, we were upstairs, I tripped over something, and looked, and they said, oh, this is shiny. And then the other guy who saw a couple of Indiana Jones movies before said, you know, it was high 12 and the beam of light shot down and illuminated the corner. <laughs> and I knew Brother Revere was speaking to me. <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, Revere is the perfect example of a Masonic artist at work. He was an artist. Uh, I, I'm lucky enough to be in, you know, outside of Boston. If you go to the MFA there, they have all of his silver, and you realize how good this guy was. I mean, he was one of the best silversmiths of his time. Um, and he brought that into the lodge. He, he was obviously extremely active in the craft, but he brought all of his talents into the lodge in the form of jewelry, of, you know, metalwork, you know, plates, stuff like that. Um, and um, it's the perfect example. So there's a lot of guys out there, you know, jewelry making is, is a lost science. Um, it's one of those things that is it's not as popular as it used to be, and uh, you know you you need a good shop to do it. But um, that doesn't mean that the lodge can't get together for an anniversary, like a hundred and fiftieth anniversary of your lodge, and and try to commission something like a new master's jewel or something like that. I mean that that would be a great gift to your lodge. Um, if you got somebody in your lodge who's a jewelry, you know. <laughs> He needs yeah. to make that known because he's going to have a very good life in masonry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's very good, and because it's it if if you think of of the jewelry in 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 general, you know, here is a, a piece of art that you wear with you, just like the apron. This one though is is something that's a little bit more durable. It's not as easy to customize. This is something that takes a lot of hard work to to create just. You know, one of them, and but it's it's a treasure. It's something that you keep Absolutely. for f forever. This is something that truly lasts forever. So it's 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 a it's an art form that I am not very familiar with. I can admire it very much, and I know the very little that I know about it is is that it's difficult to create and it's very yeah. costly to create. But once it's created, is something that has the potential of of Having a lasting effect, mm -hmm. and, and you, you can find a parallel there with when you do good work for for yourself and for masonry. You know, it might be difficult for you to do something. It might be uh, something that seems rare uh, or something that has been lost to time. But if you really work hard and take the time to make this, it's going to be a treasure for for those who come in contact with it. Absolutely. Um, you know, it, it's, I, I use the example of an anniversary, um, and I, I say this in my, one of my, uh, talks that I do, um, the, I, I find that art, and I'm extremely biased in this, uh, <laughs> um, I find that art is the, the greatest gift you can give somebody, um, especially a lodge. So if your lodge has an anniversary coming up, let's say, and, and you can plan far out. Let's say in 30 years you have a major anniversary, 175, about, you know, 200, um, or 50, or 30, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, I'm going to say the, the dreaded words, raise your dues $5 and put it into a fund that's going to celebrate that date and celebrate it with art. You know, if you've got 100 guys, five, you know, five bucks, it's 500 bucks a year, times 30, okay, you got enough to put something extremely special into your lodge and some. Mm -hmm. And that is not a gift for you. That's a gift for you and every mason that's going to come. And, yep. you know, even a master's jewel, like, if, let, do a silver master's jewel and, and uh, have that passed down from generation because I guarantee you that will be treasured in your lodge for years to come. Decades, that's, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's very true. Now we we're running short on time. I mean, we could be talking about this forever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Entering day to... seventeen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we we wanted to to talk about some of the questions that we have received through the brothers that are watching. Uh, one of the the questions that that we received was, how would you respond to someone who thinks that utilizing art uh, to to teach uh, Masonic lessons uh, is an, a violation of your obligation. Clearly, we're not going to go into the details of, of the 
of what of the obligation but are we revealing secrets by creating art and by that are we violating our commitment to to keep some things discreet that that's a great question and it was something that I brought up right when I kind of started thinking I was going to do this um, the short answer is you know what are secrets um, I know I've heard this discussion in uh, on your podcast before um, there are certain things that we are not allowed to say or do or show um, and we don't have to get into that we all know what that is um, in speaking with past masters, past grandmasters, sitting grandmasters when I was doing this, I, I asked them, I said, oh, you know, what is the square and compass a, sim a secret? Well, it's on our door, so it's probably not too bad. Uh, <laughs> um, it's in, you know, it's everybody knows it. Um, the emblems are not secrets. They're everywhere, you know. It, it, it's a fine line. Some, some Grand Lodges obviously think a little differently than that, and you have to respect the Grand Lodge that you're in, of course. Um, but, you know, there's just certain things you, you don't do. Um, in, in New Hampshire, almost, you know, unfortunately, uh, almost all of our ritual, with the exception of the obligations, lessons, and, you know, grips, words, and tokens, and all that stuff, um, that's not written out anywhere. But everything else is. And it, it, I know there are other lodge, Grand Lodges that is not the case, and I completely respect that. Um, but, uh, you know, it... It's that is the great responsibility of a Masonic artist. You have to know uh, what you can't do and what you you should do, and you have to walk that fine line. Um, you know, in, in the painting behind me, um, someone said, uh, someone asked me recently, "Well, why don't you do a candidate?" You know, going through it. Well, you know, that is walking that line. Yeah, I, that's not that's our business and not anybody else's. But it was a um, it was our grand. Uh, uh, chaplain at an installation. So, okay, my wife was there, so I'm pretty sure <laughs> everything <Yeah>. else. <laughs> um, so it, it, it's a great, uh, it's a great question, and and it's something that a Masonic artist has to fight with. And it's it's if you decide to call yourself a Masonic artist, you're doing a, you're doing your art for masonry, not just for yourself. Mm -hmm. So you need to take your obligation very very seriously, yep. and make it known that you're taking it very seriously too. That's, that's good. And the here's the way that I look at it. Uh, and it wasn't the case initially. When I first joined Masonry and then I found out that there were certain things that I was committing to and that I didn't want to divulge, uh, I, I thought, wait, well, maybe I can't do any drawings or any paintings. And, and I was very conflicted as to, you know, this is before asking clearly, uh, maybe, oh, maybe I can't. Act, actually make a painting about this. So it took me a little bit of a time before I actually asked the right questions and reached the right people to understand what can I paint if anything and what can I depict if anything. And, and here's something that has helped me have a good clear understanding of what I can and cannot do. The lessons in masonry, they are life-changing lessons they are not exclusive to masonry these are lessons that are uh, they are part of all traditions cultures religions uh, sciences you name it and so these are not secret we put them together in a very peculiar uh, system of, of allegories and this is an instrument in which we can deliver uh, a lesson that is complex that is like I mentioned life-changing but in, in a in a in a way that people are going to remember them. And then we take that big lesson and com compress it down to a symbol. That symbol alludes to that bigger, elaborate allegory, which alludes to that bigger truth. We're not revealing, if anybody has an issue with you know, teaching masonry, we're not doing that. We're showing a symbol that's intended to be that. It's the it brings a recollection of what you learned. It it's a reminder of that story. And whenever you're in a situation in which you might need to act according to that lesson, having access to that symbol is going to help you. And I'll give you an example. I'm sure you've driven behind a vehicle that has the little fish symbol, which we know represents uh, Christianity. 
Well, all you see is a little squiggly line that creates the <laughs> outline of a fish. And you can spend an entire day talking about the symbolism and the lessons that are contained within that little fish. When you see them and you're getting angry at them because they're driving slow or they stepped on the brakes or they <laughs> checked the brakes, perhaps that little symbol reminds you of your own uh, religious beliefs and maybe changes your mind from going into a, a, a rage. Or perhaps you, you get to learn more about the person or about the situation just by looking at that little symbol. Mm -hmm. By the same token, whenever someone looks at a painting on a wall uh, and he's amazing and understands what the symbol means, or if they're wearing a jewel that has the square encompasses and they come into a difficult situation, they might be reminded that they need to circumscribe their passions. Mm -hmm. They might be reminded of those other lessons. So by depicting those symbols, all you're doing is you're aiding the members of the craft to remember those things that are important to them. And you're yeah. not hearing secrets. Yeah, and, and that I think that really comes down to um, you know, the difference between a Masonic artist and someone who's ripping off the uh, the craft. And I know that was another question that was brought up, well, and I think that would kind of tie in. Let's use that as a segue. That yeah. was another question that we that we receive is what uh what do you say to people that might think you're capitalizing on on masonry or you're using uh, masonry to gain something? Well, um, there's artists in every facet of life. Um, did, can you call Michelangelo? I'm not comparing myself to Michelangelo, but can you call Michelangelo a guy who you know used Jesus' death to uh, you know gain a couple of bucks? Um, the answer is there's a clear difference between a Masonic artist and someone who is trying to just make money with Square and Compass. My motto in life right now is because of, just because something has a square and compass on it doesn't make it Masonic. You can go online right now and find everything, uh, you know, from T-shirts to uh, I saw a thong with it on yep, uh, once. Everything that can be printed has a square and compass on it. And use your judgment. You know, go to the go look at these places and say, okay. Does someone who put a square and compass on a thong respect the craft? You know, should I buy from that? Um, a Masonic artist like myself, and definitely like Brother Juan here, um, we're doing it to honor the craft. And yeah, we do make some money off of the side of it. We and you know, it's one of those things that people have to understand. We're we're talent. We're talented. This is our talents, and this is what we've spent our life honing our skills on. And we we deserve to be paid for it. Um, it, that, it's the frank nature of it. Um, but if we are cheapening ourselves or cheapening our work and putting masonry in the title, then I have a problem with it. And I've gotten into some very heated discussions about this mm -hmm. um, with some people, and it's that's my mindset. Um, you're never going to see me make a Masonic thong. <laughs> 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 Tidy whiteies, you know, you got a little more work in your hands. Uh, <laughs> um, it, it's an extension yeah. of an apron. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, well, but, uh, he, and I thought it was a great question because it's, question. it's a controversial thing to talk about. Uh, you've seen, you know, people have seen what I what I've created. I create works of art and I create reproductions of them, and I I do sell them. Now, you'll be fooled to think that I've become a millionaire or I've enriched, <laughs> <laughs> become rich by selling this. Uh, I, I, I do generate an income by this, but I'm, I'm dedicating a lot of time into creating these things. Um, if you think about it this way, if you enjoy the things that you know we do, that Brother Ryan and I do, some... We need, it takes it takes time. It takes a lot of time to create the works of art that we that we make. So, the less we are able to to sell our work, the less time we have to invest on creating more work and sharing more of the things that we've created. So, we don't we don't create something with the intention of you know this is gonna be a hit. I'm gonna you know I'm gonna become a millionaire with this one. Yeah. 
the when we you know and I, I I'm sure that you you feel the same way when I create something is I feel there's a need for for something and I want to create it the best that I can mm -hmm. and I want to create something that I would put in my wall that I would wear to lodge that's that drives me and to have brothers appreciate that and 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 reward it with their wallet it speaks it speaks volumes you know there's it's a great satisfaction uh, for me I I think it might have been a little bit easier than for other for other artists because I was making a full-time living out of being an artist and I had to very early in in my career make a decision how am I going to consolidate these two things do I create something to sell or do I create something that I'm inspired to create and and here's one thing that has helped me a lot when I'm creating I keep away any thoughts of sales whatsoever I'm Absolutely. creating something because I want it to be beautiful I want it to move people I want it to really make a difference once that thing is done then I can change my hat and say okay now how do I put this in front of the people that can actually take it and make it their own? Yeah, that, that that's the perfect way of explaining the artist, you know, uh, well I, I shouldn't say the artist, my, my thought point exactly. Um, you know, when I when I paint, um, you know, I, I go into my studio and I think it's it, what what can I do here that's important or what can I do that will bring meaning to someone. You know, it, it's a very, very special feeling the first time an artist sells a work. And when I sold my first Masonic work, it's like, I'm help. yeah, yeah, I made a couple bucks. You know, it's like you said, I'm not retiring tomorrow. <laughs> I'm not, re I plan on doing this until I make the ultimate retirement. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, um, but, uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm thinking about I'm putting a square and compass on this. This needs to be something that will mean something to a lot of people. And oddly enough, the first couple ones that I did, I didn't even intend to sell. It, you know, someone came up to me and goes like, "All right, I want this. Okay, you, you give me twenty bucks for a print." You know, and okay, well, I made fifty cents off of that. That that's probably not the best business mode. For me, but, <laughs> uh, and you know, it kind of escalated to that and. Um, as you said, it, it with the lack of Masonic artists out there right now, yeah, it's you know you and I and, and a few others gain a lot of attention. But as we were talking about before, you know, art isn't a competition. It's God willing, we inspire other people to do it. And if you if you appreciate what you do, you buy a print. We really do appreciate it. It means a lot yep. to us. But what else, you know? There's, there's, it's just a way of supporting the arts, and I have yeah. books and books of ideas that I need to get into, and they, I need to pay for <laughs> too. And uh, <laughs> it, it, it's funny this, this, this Masonic art business that I have right now just really just funds the next work of art. It's, it's kind exactly. of a vicious cycle. Like, oh, exactly. I got, I got fifty bucks. Good. Let's go <laughs> buy that seventy-five dollar canvas. You know? <laughs> why do I have no money? <laughs> That's that's yeah. that's how it is. Yeah. <laughs> well, and how you know, since we, we're running out of time, and we want to be, you know, I want to be mindful of your time. What is the best way for brothers to to get a hold of you and see your work? Um, my Facebook page, I keep um, pretty up to date. Uh, it's just Ryan J. Flynn, artist, uh, comma artist. Um, I like showing people my creative uh, process um, and, and my struggles. I, I'm working on a portrait of George Washington for a brother right now that's driving me absolutely crazy. And I, I, the, the language that I use <laughs> will not be here. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, so if you go on that, um, you, you can see me working and, and the stuff that I'm doing. Uh, all my art that is for sale is for sale at uh, ryanjflynn.com. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. It's ryan at ryanjflynn.com. Um, uh, I also do speak around at lodges. Uh, I have a few coming up. Um, uh, in, uh, I'm not supposed to announce it, <laughs> but I, I will. <laughs> um, I will be speaking at the MRF Symposium this year, and um, 
in August on uh, fine arts and masonry. And um, if you haven't been to that event, it's it's a life changing experience. But um, I'm a regular guy. Yeah, thank you. I'm 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 honored and shocked and scared. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You'll be <all> right. Yeah. <laughs> That's that. That's very good. And, and for the for the brothers listening, I wanted to say, uh, Brother Flynn had uh, he was very generous in 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 offering. He's going to have some of his work available for one lucky winner. So in the coming days, I will be putting out a a page that has the way that you can you can earn it. So I encourage you to visit his Facebook page and also go to. Uh, facebook.com forward slash the winding stairs I'll be posting it there and you can also find it in the show notes of the of the podcast so you'll find it on YouTube you'll find it wherever you look you'll find links to uh, brother brother Flynn's work as well as the opportunity for you to to take home one of these pieces so and brother thank you very much once again for for taking the time to speak with us. Yeah, I was honored. This is this has been fantastic. I, I love just chatting with artists. Uh, it's we got a different way of thinking, and it's hard to tell people that <laughs> we're, well, we're all we're all weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's do it again some other time. Absolutely. Thank you, brother. Yeah. And for those of you listening, thank you so much for your time, and join us again next time as we continue our journey up the winding stairs. <laughs>